to we're the Dutton family members of saving grace enjoy our service today Happy Father's Day uh, to all the fathers out there. A few little, we have a few uh, a video coming up, but not yet. But a couple things that um, uh, kids might say to you. Uh, look, no one else said uh, raising me was going to be easy. You just made it look that way. Huh? Dad, who else would have taught me how to play golf and eat pizza for breakfast? Dad, you were the first one to make uh, dark socks and sandals look cool. <laughs> you are a fashion icon. Uh, hopefully this Father's Day will provide you as much fun as before you had kids. How about that? And I'd like to apologize for all your gray hairs. It's genetics, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, um, fathers have done so much. They've given us the best things in life, their time, their care, their love. And uh, one person writes, I am truly grateful to have you in my life. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for acting like a kid when I was a kid, acting like a friend when I needed a friend, and acting like a parent when I needed one. You are the best man that I know. And uh, although time and distance may separate us, your guidance, advice, and love has stuck with me through it all. I would not be who I am today um, unless it was for you. And the older that I get, I realize how important it is to have a dad like you. You have provided stability in my life and a love and acceptance that I needed. So something to remember. Remember uh, your fathers on this day. He's never patient with anyone. My dad. Sometimes, and because sometimes he yells at us, so it depends on what if he's in a good mood or a bad mood. I do not think my dad is patient because he he's always asking my mom if like okay he's like. Is it ready now? 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 <laughs> he doesn't always yell right away. He's yes. patient. He talks it out, and he's nice. And he doesn't rush to things. Um, work. Um, the bank. From me, Romani, um, any. Um, steal his money from my sister's room too. Give me a kiss. Cause he will always love me every time. Cause he cares about me and he's always there for me. My dad taught me how to shoot baskets for basketball and hit a golf club even though like you have to like like latch your fingers like this and it like pulls them really hard. It, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> he taught me how to snap. He taught me how to make fires. My dad taught me how to make pancakes. Oh, I think he taught me to fish, I think, or was that my grandpa? Oh. Um, I don't know. Okay, Dad. Oh, no. I think he taught me how to throw a fishing line, or was that also grandpa, or was that mama? Okay, I don't know. that, oh, okay, we don't remember anything. Why did the salsa go to the gym? Because you felt chunky? Oh, why does seagulls only fly over the sea? Why? Because if they flew over a bay, it would be a bagel. Go. Knock, knock. Who's there? Knock, knock. Who's there? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. 
Banana who? Orange. Orange who? Orange is it? Glad I didn't say banana. <laughs> Carry boxes that are heavy. Sometimes it's hard for me to pick up my clothes, so I asked my dad for help because my mom's working, and so he completely picks out two different color clothes. Um, looking for stuff because my mom says, "Yeah, you have to look at the mom way, not the dad way," because my dad just skims everything. He's like, "Oh, it's not there." My mom pulls everything out and looks for it. This washer. Um. Uh, I think it would probably be preparing for camping, maybe. What the what? I think. What? Crack! June 28th, we're having a special uh, old-fashioned pie and ice cream sauce, and we have a little video on that as well. Hi, I'm here to remind you again of the date for our ice cream social, which will be June 28th from four to seven. And we will have a menu of barbecue plate, which consists of baked beans, pickle, and uh, chips, and beverage and ice cream and pie for $7. Our hot dog plate will be the same for $6. And if you want just pie and ice cream, that will be $4. So. I, and at quarter to seven, we will be drawing for the quilt that you have. we are raffling at that time. Please, I hope I see all of you there. And if not, I'll be out looking for you. Thank you. Faith that matters. Faith that matters. This is uh, not your father's faith. It's not your grandfather's faith. The faith that matters starts, it's actually your faith. It starts with you. We live in a different world today, don't we? And, um, and it's, uh, um, it's kind of interesting. Millennials will, will have uh, an altered sense of truth. So that is... You can have um, opposing understandings of truth and what took place, and all of them are right, whatever works for them. There was an article that was written by Nick Enfield. It says, uh, human, uh, human reasoning is celebrated to, the cap uh, to an nth degree in our, our society, yet Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman said, among others, uh, we, have, we have found out that that our own reasoning is riddled with conject, uh, co connective uh, bugs and biases. We are highly likely to believe or at least accept repeated statements that support our established views even when there is no evidence to support them. Unlike the accepted repeated statements that go counter to uh, those views, and that are well established and supported with evidence. Humans are psychologically capable of remarkable feats of focus and attention and thought, um, but um, sometimes we override them. And so he, he calls the world to, to understand that, that uh, it's not always what you see or perceive that is necessarily the truth. We have to go outside of ourselves to understand what truth is. Now, Here's, the next, here's, here's a case study in point, but of course you can just say it's just a bias because I was looking for information, right? So I looked online to see what, what people thought truth was. There were 13 different things. I'm just going to read three little ones. First one said, this was the number one answer, nothing is truth. This world is everything. Everything in the world consists only of us. Whatever we think and the majority believes is the same as truth. Now, if there is some catastrophe and everything that created gets destroyed, new creatures will grow and create their own theories of life, death, or whatever. Yeah? Uh, there exists nothing until you give it meaning. So, how about that? Tree falls in the forest, doesn't have any meaning, it doesn't make a sound if no one's there to hear it. So a philosopher said, huh? Reality is what you see, truth is what you want to see. But those who see truth, we always uh, go for the senses, their perception, and their reality. 
is the only truth. Wow. Now, reminds me of a scripture. That's why I probably read all that stuff, huh? <laughs> Ecclesiastes says, vanity, vanity, says the teacher. Huh? All is vanity. And he goes on to explain himself what that all means. You work and toil in the hot sun, and, and to what benefit? Because you die, he says. Or you work and toil in the hot sun, you gain for yourself wealth, and then what happens? You give it to someone who doesn't deserve it. They didn't work for it. You know? It's, it's been interesting. All of, and it's, it's, uh, it's attributed to, to Solomon. He's talking about wisdom. He's talking about the cyclical nature of life and trying to find meaning in the midst of that. So where do we find meaning? Are there no truths? Are there no absolutes? For the millennialists, they, or the millennials, they think that there isn't. Did you know that if you receive an inheritance, on average, Americans will receive about $177,000 uh, as an inheritance, and within five years, they've spent it all. How about that? I thought it was less time than that. <laughs> So I had heard about that, and I did receive an inheritance a long time ago. I held on to it. I think I still have a dollar left. <laughs> it's from Grandpa, you know? What is, what is permanent in this world? Maybe nothing's permanent. I heard uh, someone said the only constant is change. You know, being a dad, I, I'd have to say, yeah, that's true. I walk into a room, and it's a disaster, and I, I think entropy. This is entropy. Everything's falling apart, you know? Magnus loves to get into stuff. So God, um, but God is still in control. We read that in Ezekiel, don't we? That he'll take off a, a, brand, a tender twig, a sprig off the lofty cedar. He's talking about Israel, and he's going to plant it on a mountain just as high as Israel. And uh, on that mountain, a great cedar will grow. And then when that cedar grows, all the birds of the area will nest in its trees. And it is a fable, a riddle, a parable that he's telling. He is telling about um, this, that, that God is about to do a new thing. That when the Messiah comes, that there will be a new planting that takes place, huh? Israel will still be part of that, but, but in this, all people will be gathered together because under Christ, the Messiah, we will have salvation. And we will all be a part of one another. There is hope. And here's the beauty. Even Lutherans um, kind of get a little bit nervous and they wonder what we have to do. But it says right at the end, I, the Lord, has spoken. I will accomplish it. I will accomplish it. So when you go home today, you don't have to do anything. He's already accomplished it. You hear me? There was a man uh, named Jack. He was wa walking along a steep uh, cliff one day. He accidentally got too close to the edge. He fell off. On the way down, he grabbed a branch. And it temporarily, temporarily stopped his fall. He looked down to his horror. He saw the canyon went straight down beyond him, more than 1,000 feet. All he, had to, all he could do was hang on for dear life. And so he began to yell, help, help. Is anyone up there? Help. He yelled a long time, but no one heard him. And just about when he was ready to give up, he heard, he heard Jack. Jack, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I'm down here. I can see you, Jack. Are you all right? Yes, but who are you? Where are you? Well, I'm the Lord, Jack. I'm everywhere. The Lord, you mean... You mean God? That's me. Well, God, please help me. I promise if I get down from here, I'll stop sinning. I will be a real good person, and I'll serve you to the best of my ability for the rest of my life. Oh, wait. Easy on the promises, Jack, God said. We'll get you down here first, and then uh, we can talk. Now, there's only one thing that you have to do. Will you listen clear, carefully? Yeah, I'll do anything, Lord. Great. Let go of the branch. What? <laughs> Let go of the branch, he said. Long silence after that. Then he yelled, help, help, is there anyone else up there? <laughs> you know, isn't, and I know you probably heard that joke before, but it's a wonderful joke. It illustrates that if God, if God actually spoke to us and said, let go of the branch, would we be let, willing to let go of the branch? 
if following him doesn't always make sense because we actually have to trust and have faith in him, is it easy to do it? Never is easy to do it. It means that it's not about ourselves. It's about what he calls us to do. Boy, that's tough. In our lives, that's tough. To listen to someone else is tough. I remember my father saying to me uh, many years ago, he said, you know, um, you don't remember a thing that I told you. I've told this so many times. But then I started to go through all the list of the, um, the um, wonderful wisdom sayings that he had. And uh, he looked at me with a little scowl as a stoic Norwegian. He looked at me and, and said, well, I guess you know a few things, he said, you know. You'll always think of your dad, you know, as larger than life. And for some people, that's a good memory. For others, it's a bad memory. But we do our, have our Heavenly Father who guides us, huh? And even in the midst of that, when we have difficulties that we can't understand, this is where God never fails us. He is always there to give us strength and, and save us when we need it most. See, we, we walk by faith not by sight. Our confidence is in this, that we would, uh, Paul says, I'd rather be away from the body, that is, I'd rather be dead and my body here and me at home with the Lord, but if I have to be in this body, then um, I have to uh, tell others about what, what Christ has done in my life. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others, but we ourselves are well known to God. For the love of Christ urges us on, for we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and we have died, uh, he has died for all so that we might live. No longer for ourselves, but we might live for others. Huh? So if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, everything has become new. Isn't that great news? Do you know that you have a unique uh, message to give the world? In a world that wonders what truth is, you can say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. Now, to a, a millennial, that bothers them. You mean there's an absolute truth? Well, yeah. And that should give us comfort. Do you mean there's someone that, with more power than I? Yeah. And that should give us comfort, huh? Little Magnus is picking up habits now. So I have to watch myself, everything I do. You know, even attitude. He picks up attitude. And so if uh, I raise my voice, sometimes he'll start, oh, I say no, and he starts crying. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> no. And he knows I mean no, and he starts crying. A couple nights ago, I had to put him down, and he had a little one-hour nap. Now, why do I tell you these Magnus stories? Because you all have lived them, you know? <laughs> right? So um, I put him down um, at uh, 8.30, which is his bedtime. Popped right back up, stood right up, put him to sleep on my chest, put him down again, popped right back up, put him to sleep on my chest, put, put him down, popped right back up. I had had enough. Patience was wearing thin. <laughs> so I said, lie down. And I put him down 11 times I did that. And then he finally gave up <laughs> before I did. I was just about ready to give up. Ufta. Little Magnus, is, uh, we're, we brush teeth, you know, because my dad was a dentist, you better brush your teeth. So <clears throat> in the morning, after breakfast, then we go, and I, I'm smart enough now, I brought a chair in. Instead of holding him and trying to brush his teeth and my teeth, I have a chair there, and so I'm brushing his teeth, and I had my toothbrush in my mouth, and he grabs my toothbrush as I'm brushing his, and he starts brushing my teeth. <laughs> I thought, that's pretty good, you know? And then... Then after a little while, you know, um, I got done brushing my teeth and his teeth, and I put my, my toothbrush under the water, and I tapped it three times. I don't know why I do it three times. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I don't know what. But anyway, I just do that. And then, then I put it off to the side, and he took his toothbrush out of his mouth, put it under the water very deliberately, and tapped it three times. Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> Wanted to call up for everybody and say, look at this, look at this. And then I took a little water. You're not supposed to eat toothpaste. I guess it has carcinogens in it. So anyway, you're supposed to spit it out, but the little amount that you give them is nothing, so don't worry about it. It's fine. So I took a little water in my hand. I put it up to my mouth, swished, and I spit. Don't do that in public. So then I took a little water, put it up to his mouth. 
He swished a little bit, swallowed, and <laughs> <laughs> He's getting there. He's getting there. He, he's, he's like a tape recorder, you know? He, everything that I do, he sees. Yeah. Everything I do, he sees. So I have to think about that all the time. You know, for a little Magnus, he just has faith. He follows. Whatever anybody does, he does. He doesn't know whether it's right or wrong. He just does it. In our lives, Paul says, uh, be imitators of Christ. Who, though in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as the thing to be exploited, but he emptied himself, being uh, to the point of death, even death on the cross, for our sake, he says. Because... We walk by faith, not by sight. It's not by what we see. It's not because of what we have seen we believe. It's because of him working in our lives. The truth is, your faith must be a personal faith. It is not the faith of your father. It is not the faith of someone else or your grandfather. I met a fellow, 94 years old. I was called up and went out to Halley. They needed someone to visit him. He didn't have too much time left, so went up there. And um, sat down next to him. He has uh, dementia. And so I should have found out all the stuff that, uh, about him before I walked in, but I didn't have time. I walked right in and, and said, uh, you know, so what did you do for a living? I was a teacher, he said. Did you teach high school or college? I used to teach, he said. <laughs> you know? And that was about all I could get out of him. Where did you grow up? He didn't know. I asked him other questions all further back in his life, and he still didn't know. But I knew that he didn't have much time left, so I asked him, I said, do you believe in Jesus? He said, oh, yes, I do, he said. He knew that. And as we uh, started to, to um, I, I started to witness to him or encourage him in faith, I said, you know, John 14 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. He started to mouth the words with me. As we read, I read Psalm 20, uh, 23 to him, I saw his lips moving with mine. Read from Revelation 21, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And he was processing it. It was beautiful to see. Now, what they found is that with Alzheimer's patients, that um, their brain activity actually goes off the scale when they hear scripture read to them. It was resonating within himself. And, and uh, so we talked about the promises of God that he has. His faith was personal. He understood that the shepherd was there to guide him, even in his last days. What if on Monday, because, you know, you all have 50 years left. What if on Monday you knew that the shepherd was guiding you? Not only that, but he was there with, to take your hand whenever you needed it. That you were never alone. That he was there to encourage you in your walk. And yeah, even though he sees everything that you do, he's always there to say, it's okay, I forgive you, whenever we come to him. He's there so that we might have this personal faith and that we might share with others. The truth is that um, others will see our actions. There was a pastor that came into town in Houston, Texas. Some weeks after he arrived, he had an occasion to get on a bus. He got on the bus and and he uh, paid them paid him a, a dollar and and the the uh, bus driver gave him too much change back. Right before he went back to his seat, he thought for a moment and and he said, "Well, you gave me too much. I I have to give you this back." And you know what the bus driver said? Say, he said, say, aren't you new, the, the new pastor in town? And he said, yeah, yeah, I am. He said, well, good. I've been thinking about where I should go to church. and Maybe I'll check out your church. He got back to his seat, and he sat down, and he thought for a moment. He said, wow, for just a little change, I almost, I almost betrayed who Christ was. You know? Just a little change. Yet people see by our actions. He guides our lives so that we might know that faith matters. 
Others see it. There was a priest, an evangelist, and a minister, a Lutheran minister, we'll say. We were out in a rowboat in the middle of a pond. You may have heard this joke, too. If you haven't, just pretend like you've heard it for the first time. <laughs> priest uh, stood up. He needed to go to the restroom, so he uh, got, climbed out of the boat, and he walked right across the water, onto the shore, went to the restroom, came back. Evangelist thought that was pretty slick. He said, you know, I, I forgot my, my lunch. So he got up, walked out of the boat, right across the water, got his lunch, came back out to the boat. Lutheran minister thought, that's pretty slick. So he made up something. I think I forgot my jacket. I'm going to try it too. Got out of the boat, kerplush. <laughs> right in the water. And as he was struggling to get back into the boat, the two said to each other, should we have told him where the rocks were? <laughs> now, when we talk about faith, that means that the priest and the evangelist didn't have faith. They had knowledge. They knew where the rocks were. The, the only one with faith in that boat was a Lutheran minister that tried to walk on the water. Peter got out of the boat. huh? When he said, Lord, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said one word. He said, come. And so Peter gets out of the boat. He starts to walk across the water to Jesus. And he saw the wind and he became distracted and he started to sink. And it says in, in the Greek, it says exiphnes, which sounds like it means, and this is what it means. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he grabbed him. He held him, caught him, and he lifted him up. You understand that we may try in faith, we may fail. And when we fail, he is always there to grab us with his hand. Immediately, he reaches out his hand when we say, Lord, I need your help. He is always there to give us strength. So, in the midst of a world that uh, isn't certain about what they think, you have a precious gift to give others. This message of the kingdom of God. God gives the increase. You scatter seed. You don't know how it grows, but it does. God gives the increase. A little mustard seed is so small. Matter of fact, you can have faith the size of a mustard seed, and it can move mountains because God does the work. So we trust in him. And the faith that matters, well, it begins with you. It goes on from there. So be it, Lord. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.